little bit of a uh, synopsis of, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, our trip to Israel, and I'm not going to be showing a lot of pictures today. In fact, I'm only going to show three, and uh, kind of share a little bit of a story about them, and then later on in the upcoming weeks, we'll be taking some more time to uh, um, share a little bit more of the story and what took place there. Um, but at any rate, excerpts from Israel, just the first part today. And uh, I want to share just a little bit of uh, what God was doing on that trip. You know, um, there's a couple things that you have to know when you go to Israel. How, has anyone ever been to Israel that's in here? I'm the only one. Wow. How many want to go next time? All right, good. We're going to have a sign-up right after the morning service. No, just kidding. Um, it was just an awesome opportunity, but there were two things that I wish I had known before I got there. And maybe I kind of surmised that this might be the case. Um, but two things that I didn't think about that are absolutely 100% true, and that's this. Number one, it is the world's biggest tour trap. I mean, it's incredible. Um, you go to the Jordan River, gift shop. You go to the tomb, gift shop. Uh, go down to Bethlehem, gift shop. I mean, there's like every time you get off that tour bus, there's a gift shop right there. And if there's not a gift shop, there's people peddling gifts. And uh, I never expected that because I've been to like all over, I've been Mexico and, you know, you know four countries in Africa. And, and, and I've, I mean, I, I've seen tour traps. Nothing like Israel. It just baffled me. And uh, number two, um, most people don't dispute where key events took place. If they say that's where Jesus was born, 98% of people believe that's where Jesus was born within 10 feet of that spot. I mean, because it's been carried on generation after generation after generation. That's the spot. But you don't see the spot where Jesus was born. You see a building sitting on top of that spot. But inside the building, there'll be a little marker to where that spot was. And no matter what the key spots are, um, there's some type of building in most of those places. Um, that probably weren't, weren't there, you know, even 40 years ago. And so I was kind of a little bit frustrated with that. I was like, I don't want to see a hillside where Christ was born and see, you know, 47,000 houses on it. I want to see the hillside, <laughs> you know. But, but regardless, you can still see the key things that are there. And there are several places that are relatively untouched. And I'll show you some of those later, like the Garden of Gethsemane. It's still relatively untouched it's as it was when Jesus prayed there. Um, there's a building on this side of the garden and a building on this side of the garden, but nothing right there where it is. And that was kind of neat to see some untouched areas that really spoke to me. But um, this morning, and Matt, if you want to, I don't know, maybe you, yeah, you did, great. Um, I just want to share a couple pictures today, but I want to I just share a thought with those pictures and where they came from and what the significance is in Scripture with them. Um, this morning, and I really think that there's a lesson for us to learn. You know, this summer, um, one of the key things I would love to see God do in and through us this summer as a church is really just ramp up our outreach and our evangelism. Uh, I think, and I've been saying it for many years, I don't think we do a good job of that. And I'm not saying it's any one person's fault, because really that responsibility goes on who? All of us. And I think God really has more for us. I really believe that God would say, hey, you need to do a better job of sharing your faith. I, I think we need to do a better job of witnessing and, and reflecting Christ in our life so that our neighbors and friends and coworkers can see the difference that Christ makes in our life. Amen? We really need to do a better job of that as a church. I'm not talking about growth. I, I've said for years, healthy churches grow. Healthy things grow. A healthy plant will grow. Healthy things grow. I, I've never said, oh, we've got to get to a certain size. Uh, what God does, that's his prerogative. But the bottom line is, if we are healthy, if we are doing what God has called us to do, there should be a natural byproduct of seeing people get, get saved and baptized and discipled and add to the body of Christ. Amen? That should be a natural outpouring of a church that is healthy. And so I really want to see God do something this summer. I've been praying for that for several months now. And our whole summer activities are revolved around the idea of learning more of what God has for us concerning our outreach and our evangelism. And uh, so as I went into this trip to Israel, I'm thinking, what is it that God wants to teach me? What is it that God wants to show me because of this trip? And um, several things came to my mind, and I didn't catch it really until after I got back. And I'm putting together, and I'm looking at the pictures, and I'm like, man, there is a thread that runs through here. And we're going to look at it in just for a moment. So if I can start just for, just for a moment here. Let, let's have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing upon uh, the message here. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege, Lord, that we have to look at your word this morning. And I ask God that you would speak to our hearts. 
<coughs> and ask God that you would just um, teach us those things that you'd have for us to learn. Lord, maybe the things that we've heard before, but we need to be uh, reminded afresh and anew of them. Lord, I ask God that you would just work in our hearts, Lord. Help us to be uh, attentive to what your word says, that we may apply it. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, arriving in Israel, first of all, wasn't what I expected. Uh, when I got there, I'm expecting a Middle East country that is what? Dry, arid, desertous. And for the first time, I think she said in close to 25 years, it has rained almost nonstop. In fact, everywhere we went, the first 15 minutes of the tour was, can you believe it's raining still? It's, I mean, it's every day because it doesn't rain in Israel. Uh, she was telling us that we might get an inch a year. In, in, in the summer month, we might get an inch, maybe. And it had been raining every day, so I'm, I'm expecting this dry, arid place, and it's full green everywhere. I mean, everywhere you look, I'm like, this is not Israel. This is like Betty Lucan's flannel graph thing that makes it look really nice. I mean, this is, yeah, some of you are enough to remember those. Um, but anyway, it was just different. And so it was wet, and it was raining. So, so we're, we're get, we land in Tel Aviv at the airport, and we're driving through, and you're seeing green everywhere. And so we went through Tel Aviv, and the first place that we stopped was Old Jaffa. Old Jaffa is the old name for what we read in the Bible, the city of Joppa. You say, well, what's so neat about, you, about Joppa? Well, Joppa is considered to believe, believed to be the oldest port city in the world. And today, as you go down to the Mediterranean and you see the city of Joppa, there's, not, there's some fishing boats there. There's a couple bigger boats, but there's really not a lot there on the, on the port. But it's considered to be the oldest port city in the world. Um, Joppa is the place where the cedars of Lebanon came to build Solomon's temple. Uh, they, they would cut down the trees, they brought them to Joppa, and then they would be transported elsewhere to build Solomon's temple. But they came from Joppa. But here's where it gets interesting for me. And this is where I think part of the message is going to come from this morning, uh, is, is where we see prominent Bible involvement. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Jonah. And you guys are probably remembering you know, what took place in Joppa, in the book of Jonah. So as you're turning there, we see that there's a picture of Jonah's disobedience. And now I want you to just kind of in your mind tie a couple things together before I read this passage. I've been praying for several months that God would just allow us as a church to take another step in our outreach and our evangelism. Uh, to share the love of Christ. And we're going to really kind of hammer that this summer a little bit. Because God expects us to be a faithful witness and a testimony of what he's done for us in our lives. And so when you think of Joppa, you know exactly what was starting to take place here. So beginning in verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Stop right there, look up here. So what was the idea that God was trying to implant in the heart of Jonah? I want you to go what? I want you to go preach. I want to see that city, that great wicked city of Nineveh come to know me, right? What has God's plan always been for the ages? Just to live a good life? To fulfill our dreams and satisfactions and joys and just to be happy, go lucky and just... Boy, just get everything out of life that you can get out of it? Or are we to be witnesses for Christ? I mean, what is it that God has for us? I mean, what has been His plan through the ages that we might demonstrate through our lives, through our living, the love of Christ, that others may come to know Christ, right? We talk often about investing in the lives of others so that we can, what? Build a relationship with them so that we can invite them to the most important relationship with Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. But we talk about the whole concept of living our lives in such a way that the lost world will want to say, you know what, there's something different. What is it? And so God has this plan for Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against their wickedness and, and share the gospel. But verse 3, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. So this is the very place that Jonah ran to so that he could pick up another ship to go the opposite direction so he didn't have to do what God wanted him to do. So he goes down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went down into it and to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And we're so quick to say, well, why, Jonah, why did you run from God? I mean, why did you do this thing? And why didn't you just do what God told you to do? And I have to ask myself, well, why don't you do what God tells you to do? I mean, was his excuse any different than ours? I mean... I didn't want to. 
I have another plan. I, I have something better I want to do. I have some other things I want to get done. What, you know, it's really easy to pick on Jonah and say, Jonah, why don't you just do what I ask you to do? Well, why don't you do what God tells you to do? Why don't I do what God tells me to do? Man, we have a million excuses, don't we? We can justify it. We can rationalize it. We can excuse it away. But when, when, at the end of the day, it all comes down to just excuses. And our heart's not where God wants it to be. And so he went down there, and, and here's the thing, and it's no different in our day than it was in Jonah's day. It literally, I mean, it took energy and effort, and it cost him to run from God. He literally went down there and paid money to run from God. It costs us the same thing. When we have to learn it the hard way, when we have to surrender the hard way, and we're not willing to give in to what God wants of us. But it is at this place at Joppa that... God had to humble Jonah and make him willing to do as he had commanded him. And I want you to see this thread of humility that runs through these passages here in Joppa. Um, so the first thing is that God humbled him there. And we know the rest of the story if we were to take the time. And verse 4 says, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. And uh, <coughs> a little bit later... Uh, in the upcoming weeks, I'll show you some of the things I got to see as I was out on the Sea of Galilee. But I was out there on a relatively calm day. But even though it was a calm day, the waves were like, you know, you could see the white caps in certain spots. You, you could see the boat moving like this. And there was rain, and it was crazy. I had Sunday service on the Sea of Galilee. But the thing that stands out is this. He's out there, and it's not hard to, to get a picture of the wind coming and the waves getting out of control. Then the mariners were afraid, verse 5, and every man cried out to his God, small g, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. And we know the rest of the story. They cast lots. Ant lands up on Jonah, and they throw Jonah into the water, and he gets swallowed up by a great fish. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get swallowed by a great fish. That doesn't even sound remotely fun. Um... It's not something I'd want to do. But it was what God used in the life of Jonah to humble him. I want you to keep that in your back of your mind just for a moment. That God used a great fish to swallow him up, to humble him, to make him willing to do what he had commanded him to do. So, interesting thing that happens off the coast of Joppa on the Mediterranean Sea. Then go over to Acts chapter 9, if you would. Just a few pages to the right. Acts, Romans, in Romans, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 9, there's something else happens here. And we know the story of what happens earlier in Acts chapter 9. God gets a hold of Saul, and uh, let's begin reading verse 36. It says, At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. And this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with him. <coughs> but Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints, the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. You say, well, where's the line of humility here? You know, it was here that the disciple named Tabitha or Dorcas died. And Peter comes and prays over her and resulting in the great miracle and the salvation of many. Because it says there... Um, in verse 42, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. You say, well, where's that thread of humility that's still taking place years later after Jonah's off the scene? It's in the life of Peter. And Peter goes down here, and Peter, you know, by his own admission, he's nothing great. We know that he's the one that, you know, really ought to have a sign that says open mouth, insert foot. And uh, he's the guy that's very spontaneous, and, but yet God's using him here. 
And I have to imagine people with clout. Just kind of get in your mind what that kind of looks like just for a moment. People with clout. You know, they might have money. They might have position. They might have prestige. They might have possessions. They might have a lot of different things. But when you think of people with clout, people with position, what comes to your mind? And I have to imagine just for a moment, because I know I'm a preacher, and we probably are supposed to think this way as preachers, but, you know, I can't imagine walking with Jesus. Can you think? I mean, just get that in your brain for a moment. Can you imagine waking up every day and saying, I'm going to go see Jesus again? Wouldn't that be really cool? Okay, both of you think it would be. Um, seriously, come on now. How cool would that be? Can you imagine being part of that inner crowd? and walking with Jesus, and seeing the miracles, and hearing His teaching, and being a part of the ministry that God gave the, did through Jesus' His Son. I mean, think about that just for a moment. I'm Peter. I walk with Jesus. I'm John. I walk with Jesus. No. You think because maybe of his position, he might get some clout. He might get some, boy, hey everybody, Peter's over here, let's go with him. He walks with Jesus. No, it wasn't like that. Peter was very humble. In fact, I want you to get something in verse 43. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. So I want you to look at the next uh, two, two slides over there. You see this one right here is old Joppa. And then go one more. This is the house of Simon the tanner. Um, this House is literally undisputed as the house where Simon the Tanner that we read of in Acts chapter 9, verse 43, lived. Um, we know that it is now owned by the Zechariah family. Um, we didn't get to go in the house. Uh, this particular house has been uh, restored <coughs> slightly. Um, but it's relatively said some of the stones on this front area here that have been restored are probably still around five, 600 years old. But this is the house that goes literally back to this passage. You say, well, what's so significant about house of Simon the Tanner? Well, I don't know. If you were a person that walked with God, walked with his son Jesus Christ, I would want, if Jesus were to come here today, or if his inner circle were to be here, what would we do with them? Just think about that question. Let me explain just a little bit further. Let's just think for a moment that Jesus and his ministerial assistants were coming to our church. And they're going to be here for a week doing ministry. Where would we house them? Would we put them in some old shack out back? Would we throw them out in a camper out in the back 40? No. We would want to put his choice people and himself in the nicest hotel. I mean, we'd want to, whether it's right or wrong or whether it's best or not. We, in our flesh, we want to take care of our guests, don't we? We want to put him in the nicest motel. Make sure all of his comfort are taken care of. But then there's Peter. And he, he's in Joppa. He's doing ministry. <coughs> and he stays at the house of Simon the Tanner. And I have to be honest with you. This is our first stop on the trip. And I'm thinking, so far I'm not impressed. There's an old building, an old house. Big whoop. I wasn't there yet. It just wasn't hitting me that I'm at, standing at the house of Simon the Tanner until later on that night in a motel. And all of a sudden it hits me. Simon is a tanner. He's one who makes skins last. Modern day taxidermist. I say, well, okay, what's the deal? Um, do you know what they used to tan with? Back in that day? <laughs> Urine. Urine. Now, and this is the way it worked. This, the, the tour guide who has a degree in archaeology and has been studying this stuff and said this is basically how it works. People who lived along the coastal lines would use the restroom. I know it sounds gross. And they would uh, do number one in some type of a pottery vase, some type of pail, and they would bring it down to 
Simon the tanner's house so that he could use it to do his work as a tanner. You say, well, that's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Now, keep on the thought just for a moment. Peter is walking around Joppa on the shoreline doing ministry. He didn't stay in a nice hotel. He didn't stay at someone's really nice home on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. He stayed in the house of Simon the Tanner. Now think about what it might have smelled like in the middle of the summer heat. You starting to get a picture? You starting to get what it's looking like here? So it was that he stayed many days, not just a night, not just a couple days, but many days in the house of Simon the Tanner with the buckets and vats of urine in the summer heat. I'd imagine the flies, the stench. Why? Because God had called him to a place to do ministry. And he put aside his own whims, his own wishes, his own comforts, his own, for all that we think of for when we think of Peter. We don't hear this side of it, do we? We don't think about the very fact that he gave up his creature comforts to stay in a stinky, urine-infested house so that he could stay along the seashore to do ministry. I think there's a little bit of humility there. And I think it requires humility to reach those around us. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Let's look at one more. Acts chapter 10, just over a couple verses to the right. Acts chapter 10, beginning of verse 9. <coughs> this is also the place. The next day, after he raises Dorcas, the next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they, were, they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a, an object like a great sheep bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. So here he is down here, and God begins to provide for Peter. And God begins to show Peter what he needs to do to continue his ministry. And so here he has this great vision of the great sheet. So the common thread in each of these incidents or events is that took place in Joppa. The common thread is this, humility. Humility learned in the belly of a great fish. What is it that God's doing in your life to teach you humility? See, man, there's a lot of things that happen that I, just not, I would not choose, right? Because none of us chooses the hard thing. None of us enjoys the hard stuff. I mean, why is it that, I mean, when we go out on a trip, we pray that we would have traveling mercies. Why? Because we don't want a flat tire. We don't want the car to break down. None of us in our of ourselves would pray for hardship. We run from that. But what is it that God is trying to do in our life to teach us humility? Humility, staying in the house of Simon the Tanner, that is not a place I would choose. I would run from that place. In fact, how many of you have ever been to a motel? You walk in the door and say, what in the world did we just purchase? I've had those kind. One that commercial said, we'll leave the light on for you. I wish you wouldn't because I didn't want to see what I saw when, there when I saw the light on. I want to get out of there. Humility and being reprimanded by God of the universe. Well, I can't eat this. God's not clean. Whoa, wait a minute. Don't call anything common that I have blessed. Can you imagine being reprimanded by God? <laughs> a little bit of humility. If we are going to be used of God, we must exhibit humility. We're going to come back to that just for a moment. One more picture I want to show you this morning. This is of Caesarea Maritima. 
Caesarea by the sea. And this is really cool. I'll show you the more detailed pictures a little bit later. <coughs> Excuse me. But this is really unique because it really is as it was years and years and years ago. Um, this is just one little part where you're looking out over, over the uh, sea there, Caesarea. And by the way, there was lots of Caesareas because Caesar had a thing for himself. And everywhere he went, he named a city after himself. And there's like eight Caesareas, by the way. So everywhere he went, he just, oh, I like this place. Call it Caesarea and whatever. And so anyway, this particular place that you can't see here, and I'll show you the pictures later. But if you look to the right of the picture, there is a stadium, an amphitheater type thing that kind of went along the seashore. And you could see where the chariots had races and, and they would have fun there and they would gather there. Um, it was the place where early Christians spent most of their time. <coughs> in the, they had open air markets and they would gather there and they'd just have a great time of fellowship, watching the races and doing some of the things that they did. It was the capital of Judea under the Roman uh, Empire. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 30, this was the place where Saul, or Paul, was sent before leaving to Tarsus. In fact, verse 30, it says this. It's just before we started to read. In verse 30, it says, When, breth when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. So is this just a little drive away from Joppa, just up the road a little ways? And here is here where, you know, right after Saul has his conversion testimony, and he's sent away. Because you remember what Saul was like? Fun guy, right? You, you, you all want him as Facebook buddies, right? You want to get together and have a little bit of fellowship with him, right? No. He was not a nice guy. Wasn't somebody you want to spend a lot of time with. Um, wasn't a man that you would want to, to know intimately. But after his conversion, he too had a new testimony. And we find out here, um, that it was Barnabas in verse 27 that took him and brought him into the apostles and declared them. He said, listen guys, he's one of us now. And they're like, eh, I'm not sure if I'm buying this. Is he really one of us or is he not? <coughs> so, as he was, so he was with them in Jerusalem, coming in, in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord, verse 29, and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. But when the brethren found out they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus. So he goes down here and picks up another ride going into Tarsus. And I have an amazing thing here. All these things are about getting the gospel out. This is a key area. The, the gospel was spread out. Think about this. From this place starts the gospel. From these places, the gospel goes out into all the world for centuries. I wonder... Has the purpose and the vision of what God was trying to start there changed? I don't think it has. He still wants the gospel to go out. And he still does it through people who will humble themselves to do what he asks them to do, not what they want to do. In Acts chapter 10, um, just a page over here, let's look at verse 24. Acts chapter 10, verse 24 says, And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and called together his relatives and close friends. And by the way, if you look back at verse 23, then he invited them in and lodged them. And on the next day Peter went away with them and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Remember what took place in Joppa? Many believed because of the miracle that took place. And so now these men who believed there were now getting on board and said, we're going to go do this with you. So they go on, verse <coughs> 25, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up. I myself am also a man. Think about that just for a moment. You think when people don't have clout because of who they hang with? Yeah, they do. And Peter, they can see Peter and they come down before him and go, Whoa, wait a minute. Get back up. I'm nobody. So God was humbling him. He's learned some humility. And he's realizing it's not about me. It's not about me. And can I just say it's not about you either? I don't care how great you think you are, it's not about you. It's all about him. We have to always remember that. Verse 26, Peter lifted him up. Verse 27, and as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. 
And then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to an, one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Remember the miracle that he just done? Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason you have sent me? So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea, and when he comes he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well well to come. Now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. And God is working to use him to bring out the gospel. This is where Paul and Peter preached with boldness and saw God work in the hearts of many. In verse 34 you see that. And then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. Let me say that again. That in truth God shows no partiality. Been talking about that a little bit as well. Some Sunday nights. You know, you know where we all came from? One. All from Adam. Why is it that we show partiality towards different skin colors, different ethnic groups, different people that we don't agree with or understand? I think one of the greatest blessings of having traveled to several countries of Africa and Mexico and and uh, Israel is you see different people. But you see God working in the hearts of many. And it's amazing how a brother over here and a sister over there and a brother over here and a sister over here all come together and we are one. But we sometimes think we're better than everyone else. We're still going to come back to that in just a moment. (coughs) But we see God doing a work here. And he says, uh, verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through all Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews in Jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Not to all of you, but to witnesses chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Just a couple more verses. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge over the living and the dead. (coughs) Think about this. God wanted the gospel to go out. He didn't want this group or that group or this social status or that social status or this position or that place of prominence. He says, I want the world to know. And over and over, it says, To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should be not be baptized who had received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So Peter was out once in humility, preaching the gospel, doing whatever God had asked him to do, walking through all the open doors that God had opened for him. I won't take the time to get into all of it, but in Acts chapter 25 and 26, Caesarea is the place where Paul made his defense before Festus and King Agrippa, before heading to Rome. But again, I see this threat of humility, humility exhibited in these couple of texts. Humility in Saul to do as he was told, though many did not trust or believe his testimony. Many did not believe. He had a reputation. Who is this guy who now claims to know Christ? And Barnabas steps up and says, Hey, I've seen it. I've witnessed him. He is with boldness teaching and preaching the truth. Humility that Peter had learned in working with his co-laborers. Hey, whoa, whoa, get up. Do not bow before me. Get up. I'm just a man like you are. The humility. 
in all these texts, what was taking place? The gospel message was either being proclaimed or the way was being paid for the gospel message to be proclaimed. And humility was either being taught or humility was being learned through the entire storyline of what was taking place in these two cities. And I thought to myself as I was sitting in my motel room, I was like, I wonder what God is trying to do to humble me. Man, he wiped me out. I'm telling you, for three weeks, I had zero energy. Getting an infection. But even in the infection, I still said, oh, I'll take care of it when I get home. <coughs> God said, no, you're not. You're going to go in an Israeli hospital, and they're going to stick a 1920 contraption on your arm. It has a bunch of valves on it. And take way more blood than I've ever seen taken blood before. It's like, you're not in control, can you? I just know that God humbles us in different ways to make us dependent upon Him so that He can use us to do what He asks us to do, not what we want to do. Humility. Humility is either being taught or humility was being learned throughout this entire passage. And we as God's children must get this principle right if we're going to have any success in reaching the world around us. And this is where I want to tie it together here just for a moment this morning as we close. Most of us are more concerned with being right than we are than showing love to a lost world around us. Most of us are known for what we think is best more than a listening ear, even though we may not agree. You say, am I saying, Pastor, don't stand up? No, I'm not saying that. I'm definitely not saying that. But how we act and react around a lost and dying world? Folks, come on. Is there any wonder they don't want what we've got? We stereotype. We look out with prejudice. We assume their story even though we haven't talked to them. Come on now. It's true, isn't it? Some of us need to humble ourselves in the sight of God so that he can use us to carry on what he wants us to do. Quit worrying about being right. I don't have to defend God. God doesn't need defense, right? Do you believe that? He doesn't need you to fight somebody. He got it. He's got it. What he wants you to do is stand for truth. Arguing doesn't get you anywhere. It just ticks people off. Let me give you an example of this since we're talking about compass care and the walk for life. I walked away from watching Unplanned with so many different emotions in my mind. Has anybody seen that yet? You need to see it. I was laughing at times. I was crying at times. I was angry at times. We talk about abortion. Anybody not against abortion? I mean, we're all, we're, we're all on the same page, right? I mean, why not argue that point? Oh, we, did, we, we, we think abortion is wrong. Okay, great. So here's what comes to my mind as I'm watching this. You got, in one scene, people standing on the other side of a wall or a gate or a fence yelling at the people on the other side with their signs. And across the country, you see people with signs. And you know what the sign does to the person who's hurting most times? It says, you don't care. You haven't asked me about what circumstances are. You just irritate me. And you have no love. So there's that side of it. And I'm like, yeah, I, can, I, I didn't really think about that from, bef you know, from that perspective before. But then I think, well, what should we be doing? And then you see a little bit later in, in, in the film that they're standing there at their fence just praying that God would touch the hearts of those young ladies who are going in there. And prayer is so powerful. We don't give God enough credit for prayer. I'm just telling you, we don't. Some of you don't pray. Some of you aren't convinced that prayer does anything. Truth. But you're watching them pray and you say, yeah, I should be praying more. And then you find out a little bit later that God works in the hearts of not only some of the ladies who were coming in there through the prayer, but one of the directors who was 
inside orchestrating all this. And God changed her heart. How is it that we are more concerned with being right than we are at showing love to a world that needs to challenge you on this? Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. When God, in the Word of God, tried to reach the lost world, the main message was the love of God. To the religious crowd, it was judgment. Because we can be so judgmental towards a lost world rather than pointing them to the love of God. I'm not saying don't stand up. That's not what I'm saying. I want you to hear me clearly. This is just one example. We need to take stands. But choose your battles. Don't be so concerned with being right that you don't show them God's love. You've got to get that. And sometimes God is trying to humble us to help us see that. Number two, we must be willing to be uncomfortable if God's going to use us for his work. We must learn to be uncomfortable. Let me ask you this question. Do you think Peter was comfortable in the house of Simon the Tanner? Just, what's your opinion? Yes or no? No. No. <coughs> I can't imagine just for a moment. I, I'm just telling you, every time I go anywhere, I want a fan going. I sleep with my window open this far all through the winter. See, well, that's why you got the cold. It probably is. Um, I want to be comfortable. I mean, all summer long, I want, I mean, I want to be cool. All winter long, I want to be warm, right? I mean, is that normal? We want to be comfortable. I want a fan on me, you know, 365, man. I, I sleep with the fan next to my bed. I want to be comfortable. I can't imagine Peter going into the house of Simon the Tanner, not just for a day to endure, not just for a couple nights, but for several days and maybe numerous trips as he, as he would come into Joppa. He had a friend in Simon the Tanner. And this stinky, stenchy, urine infested house can't imagine the flies and the bugs germs if you're a germaphobe you ain't never going to last there man I'm walking up and down the you know the places and, and I'm like trying not to touch handles everywhere across Israel because I'm like well, I, I don't like public railings and stuff I kind of freak out on that sometimes I carry a bottle of stuff with me everywhere. You know, I can't imagine that. But Peter was willing to be uncomfortable to do the work that God had called him to do. One more, number three. We may have to be willing to give up our rights if we're going to have an impact for the God of our world. What rights? So what's well, my right? I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. I can do whatever I want. I'm an American. Go to another country once. See how, see how far your rights as an American last over there. <coughs> they don't last. I'm amazed as I, one of the things I saw, and if you kind of agree or don't agree, that's okay. I'm just going to tell you, walls work. We went into Bethlehem. All the way around Bethlehem, is a wall that is taller than our ceiling. Solid, cement, flat wall. And it goes all the way around Bethlehem. Ain't nobody getting in or out except through that gate. I'm just telling you, the walls work in that scenario. They control it. Here's what's interesting to me. In Israel, there are Christians, there are Jewish folks, and there are Muslims. And uh, it's interesting that Bethlehem is controlled by who? Palestine. If you're truly a Christian who's an Israeli, you can't get in there. In fact, our tour guide is Jewish, was Jewish, and when we went into Bethlehem, controlled by the Palestinians. 
she had to step down and we had to get a different tour guide for that day as we went inside Bethlehem because she's not allowed to go in there. And I thought to myself, that is sad. If you're truly, you may be Israeli, but you may be Jewish, and there are a handful of Jewish folks there that do believe in the in the in where Christ was born and and and, and Bethlehem and what took place there, and they're not allowed in. They have no rights there, even though they're Israeli. They have no rights. I thought to myself. What rights would I be willing to surrender? I don't want to surrender any of my rights. I'm just being honest. Anybody want to give up some rights? Your right to speech, right to life? I mean, anybody want to give them up? Yeah, I don't see any hands raised. I mean, we love our rights. We fight for our rights. We, we scream for our rights. And what I see in Scripture is a lot of people who for the cause of Christ are willing to give up their rights. To see God do something. I don't know about you, but that's a hard thing to consider. But in order for me <coughs> to be more concerned with being, there would be more concerned with showing God's love than to be right. In order for me to be willing to be uncomfortable to reach the world around me. In order for me to be willing to give up my rights. It's when I require humility. And what did God say in Second Chronicles? If my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves. I would rather humble myself than for God to have to humble me. What is it that God wants to do in and through your life that's going to require you to say, God, I surrender? To reach our Jerusalem, so to speak, our Judea, our Samaria, our uttermost parts, where God has us. <coughs> Are we willing to show love more than be right? Are we willing to give up our comforts to do what God has us to do? Are we willing to surrender our rights to fulfill what God has for us to do? Then we need to humble ourselves. Let's pray.